Hey folks, welcome back to the Tech Leaders Talk podcast where experts talk about the industry and hard-earned career wisdom with your host, Barry Newkirk. Today, we're jumping into another Lessons Learned episode where we take a break from the interviews and Barry and I just talk about the themes that have developed over the past few weeks and we're excited to jump in today. All right, so Barry, over the last couple of episodes, we've had a number of themes that have been running through and we've had one of these wrap-up episodes before, but we've got five more themes to kind of hit the highlights on. And we're starting out with one that has been, if if I'm not wrong, universally touched on in, in every episode we've had so far. And that is the idea of relationships. Well, I tell you, I think you're right, Nathan, in that of all the 10 episodes we've done so far, uh, relationships is really uh, a cornerstone for each one of the houses that each one of our guests has built in his, his career thus far. So the thing I wanted to mention to our audience is it's easy, I think, to overlook relationships because particularly because we're tech people, we're tech leadership. You know, we went into this career, most of us, many of us, since certainly the folks who were on the podcast so far, uh, because they love computers and they love tech and they love delivery and what tech could do. But at the end of the day, uh, at least in this industry, relationships are incredibly key to having the ability, the bandwidth, the knowledge, um, the social capital, the political capital to be able to get things done. Um, so you heard, <clears throat> uh, whether it's Chris Estes in our very first episode, talk about his relationship with his family member and how that person actually introduced him to tech. It happened to be media technology, um, and that spawned uh, his long and illustrious career. You heard from, who was it, Dan Johnson, who got started in middle school tech just by somebody saying, Hey, you want to go play with play on this computer? Mm -hmm. Um, and every guest thus far has also talked in the vein of relationships about mentors and people who have helped them along the way. So I think, uh, relationships is something easy for, uh, everybody understands, but it, I also think we kind of, it's almost like table stakes or the, the cover charge to get into the club nowadays. Um, but it's easy to overlook that. You know, I was reminded over the last six or eight eight days that, you know, you're really the sum of the five or ten people that you hang out with the most. And you have to be real careful and, and really curate who those people are. And um, that is a real key situation, uh, key decision, I should say, for people as they're growing their career, whether it's in technology or any other field. Yeah, I think you mentioned uh, Dan Johnson. I think he was the the guest who talked about the the call or the the letter on uh, sort of government stationery sent down to Disney on his behalf. Am I remembering yeah, that? That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. It, it was about who he knew. I think that was a a friend of a of a roommate or a girlfriend or right something like that. You know, I'm in creative media myself, and my tendency is to be. You know, this is a bit unusual me being in front of the camera and behind the mic, usually I'm behind the camera. And so my tendency is to think about, well, I do the creative side. Um, I, I'm the practitioner and I, you know, support, support the folks who are sort of the talent or, or out in front. But, you know, my whole business, my whole career is, is based on who you know to be able to find the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't get behind the camera until I've, you know, had the face-to-face -face conversation and the somebody who knew somebody to to get the right talent, the right opportunity queued up. Yeah, I think I think that's so true. And I, and it's really um, Phil Yanov and I joke have joked for years about it's not important who, you know, it's important who knows you. Hmm. And and that is something that I think our society is really getting um, getting in tune with, hmm. particularly with social media and LinkedIn and all the things um, that you know, people know of a lot of different, you could call them influencers or creators or whatever the right word is, but, you know, leaders are known. Mm -hmm. Leaders are known and they're easy to see is, has been my experience. And so <clears throat> the ability to stand out and initiate and cultivate and grow relationships over years mm -hmm. is a very critical factor and something that I, it's a muscle that you have to exercise and it will grow. Yeah. It, and if you don't exercise it like any other muscle, it will atrophy. Um, so relationships is 
an easy one to start with yeah. in a conversation like this, but it's also, I really want to underline and highlight that because it's a really, it's like I said, it's a cornerstone to success for the vast majority of people. Do you have an example um, fresh on your mind of a way that your strength in relationships has benefited your business or the opposite where uh, you let some of that slide um, earlier in your career and you had to build that muscle back up? Oh, absolutely. Well, um, I was reminded last on Friday of this past week uh, that I listened to a separate podcast because I'm always learning and try to be curious, which we'll talk about later. But um, a gentleman in my business in the, in the executive search recruiting world said, you need to talk to everybody you've ever talked to every three months. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> that's a tall order. That's a that's a lot of phone calls and text messages and LinkedIn posts and whatever. Yeah. But the premise is, you know, you need to stay in touch with the people that you want to do business with. Um, and for a fair number of my contacts and relationships, I've done that. But there's also people that I have, frankly, uh, transparently neglected. Hmm. And those relationships over time will go away. Yeah. I think a lot of people have experienced, Nathan, uh, that during COVID. Hey, I used to go hang out on Wednesday nights at this place and see John and Sally and this person and that person. Well, <clears throat> at least for 2020, most people didn't do that. And so a lot of those relationships um, atrophied. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, the beneficial side is uh, there are a number of clients that have been with us, a number of relationships that I've personally benefited from that I've had for over 20 years that I just have some kind of regular cadence where we connect in some fashion. Um, I had breakfast last week with Keith Warner, one of our uh, early podcast guests, but I've known Keith and worked with Keith off and on since the year 2000. So it's 2022 now. So that's 22 years that we've been just kind of hanging out and doing stuff. Um, we were texting this morning. So, <clears throat> and Keith has helped us with a number of different things across the years. That's a good exercise for me. I, uh, my voicemail memo on my phone literally says something to the effect of, you know, thanks for calling. Sorry, I missed you. Uh, please text me. Don't leave a voicemail. Uh, because, and that reveals, you know, some of that's generational, I think. And, and But some of it's just the discomfort with staying on top of those intentional relationships because, you know, I would prefer to be able to sort of hide behind a text screen. Mm -hmm. And now texting is great for what it is. Sure. But um, but I, I could use I could use a dose of that medicine myself to be more intentional about making those connections in ways that uh, that make sense to strengthen the strengthen those networks. Yeah. Well, let me say most of our senior level uh, folks in and I'm 56, so I consider myself senior or senior level. Um, they love text messages. Mm, OK. Um, <clears throat> The, the cool thing about text messages, I think, and I've said for years, is that once you have an established relationship, mm -hmm. then text is for leaders who are in meetings all the time yeah. or running from fire to fire or whatever the case might be, um, is really a highly efficient way to deal with somebody that you already have a relationship with. It's not a good way I have found um, to establish a new relationship, although that does happen. Sure. Uh, we have a platform inside of our company where we uh, use text messaging to reach very busy tech people, both inside of our company uh, around the country, but also outside of our company. Um, and so sometimes it can be a real starter point hmm. when you can't get somebody on the phone. Um, I love the phone. I grew up professionally on the phone. Yeah. Um, I've always loved the phone. It's always been my ideal medium. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing wrong with text messages. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad I brought it up. That's a good, that's a good word. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to number two, theme number two here. And this is the idea of being all in. Uh, what does that mean to you, Barry? Maybe we'll, we'll take the personal side first. What does it mean for you to be all in? And then what were some of those guests or some of those highlights that made you, uh, made that theme rise to the surface? Well, I, I will tell you, first of all, I'm going to give a full uh, credit to Dabo Sweeney, okay. uh, Clemson's, who coined that term. Sure. And it's an amazing term. And I'm a longtime USC Gamecock, as most of my friends know. And it's hard for me to give credit to the to our friends yeah, up the road at Clemson. But it's a controversial take there, it, Barry. It, yeah, well, it, it is what it is. He's is. He's got a couple national championships, so he'll be all right. But um, I think uh, the thing for All In that resonates with me uh, – 
personally, to answer your question is that um, on the Gallup Strength Finders, my number one uh, strength across all 34 is focus. Mm -hmm. So I've said on this podcast before, you know, I make a joke, I can step over a dead body on the way to a goal. And that's very, very true. And people who know me. Um, but the thing that struck me and why I wanted to include this in our lessons learned episode is that all in uh, really is a theme that nobody used those two words together uh, in the <clears throat> first uh, 10 episodes, but they were all very focused on what they were doing. Okay. It, it didn't, it didn't dominate their life. They didn't only think of work, but if you, if you listen to Raymond Gray or Will Sprang or Phil Yanoff or David Jeraman or any of those folks, they were really focused and all in on the task at hand. They weren't thinking about, yes, they probably had a five-year plan or a three-year plan or a 10-year plan. They probably had that in writing somewhere because they're smart people, but they were really focused on today, this week, this month, this is what I got to get done. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> sometimes I find when I talk to candidates around the country, they're always looking for the next thing. They're always looking for the next thing. When the truth is, if you really focus and do a great job at what you're doing and have relationships and have the skill sets that you need, your work is going to be good enough to help you. It's not the only thing that will help you, but you got to really focus and be all in on what you're doing, whether it's getting a certification in tech, whether it's going from a hands-on practitioner to a manager, team lead, whatever the case might be. Um, Leaders notice people who are really focused and all in, as Dabo says. Yeah, I'm reminded of David Jai Raman's episode where he, as a boy in a very rural town in India, you know, he had that vision um, that took a lot of dedicated effort, right? That vision of being, you know, being the person on the plane flying overhead um, to accomplish those goals to, um, you know, eventually, you know, he came over to the States, but more than that, more than just immigrating. Um, it was that vision for college, that vision for a career, that vision for being that business leader and business owner. And at every step in that journey, it, it's sort of the, the, the two sides of the coin, having the grand vision, but also having what it, what it took to, okay, from being uh, in poverty in a very rural place to do what it took to get into the university and then to have the connections that took him international, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, I mean, I think um, before I got in tech, I was uh, selling windows and doors, not Microsoft Windows, but actual windows yeah. and okay. doors for uh, very high end homes for Pella, both on the uh, West Coast and then on the East Coast. And, you know, we always work from a set of blueprints. People may not have built a house. I've never personally built a house, nor do I have any desire to. But if I was going to do that, we would work from a set of blueprints. But like Phil Yanov said, you got to do your life is built brick by brick. Yeah. That's a great metaphor to say, hey, I got to focus on making sure this brick is set square and straight in the wall so that the six or eight bricks down the road will not be leaning. Yeah. Um, but you're also working off a set of blueprints. So that's the grand vision. Yeah. But you still got to do the work day to day. Um, and I, I just love when Dabo came out with that uh, phrase all in several years ago. One, I hug my head as a Gamecock. I went, oh, guys, this is not going to be good for us. And it, and it has not been traditionally. <laughs> um, but also, it's so it's so flipping true. You just got to mm. be focused on yeah. what you're doing. You know, in, in football, people say just do your job, do your job, do your job. You could use that phrase, but all in is just it resonates. Yeah. There's a, a direct through line to our third topic here. Um, you mentioned with all in, if you're, if you're being all in on the task at hand, that is good that is what gets noticed. And the irony being, if you're all in where you are, without even looking for it, that's our next theme, the idea of not looking for the next opportunity, but it happening upon you. Right. Um, it really isn't just happening upon you. It's because you're all in in the moment. That's why the opportunities that you can then see and take advantage of come up. So uh, let's talk a little more about uh, not looking for that next opportunity and yet seeing it almost miraculously unfold in front of you. Right. So um, we've interviewed a number of enterprise level, nationally recognized CIOs. Most of those people said during their career progression conversation that they weren't looking, somebody came to them. Mm -hmm. um, 
so again, I think you're right in that, that being all in on what you're doing, but building enough of a relationship base and having great enough work and having a high enough profile uh, where you have credibility and that attracts people to say, Hey, I think Nathan would be great at this. Let's mm -hmm. call him and ask him, or it could be, I think Barry might be good for this, but he probably knows somebody that would be good for this role or a good fit in this leadership position. Um, those are things where the, I, we, we run into candidates every week who are always looking, always looking, always looking. Well, those, those people are great. That's great. If you're in the kind of a contractor consultant space where you you do need to be always looking at nothing wrong with that, but <clears throat> you know, people understand, Hey, he's focused on his job at hand. Um, so I think, you know, if, if I go back to Chris Estes, I don't think he ever applied for a job. Mm. People, people came to him, uh, Keith Werner. I laughed and I said, Hey, have you ever proactively applied for a job? And yeah. I think he chuckled and said, no, not really. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Skip Lohmeyer the same way. I mean, a number of our guests have said the same thing is that people came to me mm -hmm. and said, Hey, I think you'd be a good candidate for this, or I think you should think about this opportunity or we need your help yeah. with this thing. And they're not asking, they're saying, we really need your help. Dan Johnson was that way. Yeah. Hey, we really, we need somebody here. You're the guy let's go. Yeah. You know? Um, but the person who's always going, Hey, what's the next opportunity? Hey, what, you know, is like a pesky sales guy. Sure. Just do your job. Man. Yeah. Things will work out. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, I'm trying to put myself in that mindset of if I'm looking at a specific industry and looking for the, you know, internally, I am looking right. I am sure. hungry for that for that next kind of step up the ladder. But if I were to flip it around and go, all right, if someone was looking at me, what is the profile of the person that someone calls up? What does that look like? Right. Um, and you know, it doesn't look like you know I've got my LinkedIn pulled up while I'm at work and I'm scrolling through or I'm you know doing all of this sort of external hustle and show and flash mm -hmm. it means yeah i'm building my network but in this moment like i want wherever i am now to be a shining testament to the kind of person that someone calls right um, and that's the long game is long game thinking and that's not always you know when you're hungry for for what's next it's not always easy but i i can see the wisdom there yeah i think um you know there's an old uh, adage where um Salespeople can either sell the steak or they can sell the sizzle. Okay. And I think in social media, a lot of people sell the sizzle. Mm -hmm. Hey, look at me, how great I am. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you know, whatever the case might be. And a lot of that's awesome. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the real winners are the ones who deliver the steak, but have an understanding that there's a sizzle mm -hmm. there, but they can back up what they say. Yeah. And in tech, I have found, and maybe in other industries, but I don't have a lot of experience in other industries, um, there are pretenders. Mm. Um, you don't want to be a pretender. Okay. Because once you're categorized as you're in your peer group or in your um, influence circle as a pretender, it's hard to get out of that. Yeah. You have to kind of put up or shut up. Yeah. You know, and well, it's, <laughs> it's a little crass, but it's true. Yeah. What are... Um what are some of the behaviors or the earmarks that, are, what are the tells for that kind of a person? Just so that the listener can, can, you know, can watch out for, am I, am I demonstrating the behaviors that, that you would identify as, you know, oh, that's the pretender, that's the, the sizzle guy instead of the steak guy. Typically I find sizzle people love to talk about themselves and they want to tell you how great they are, the project they were on. And they say, they always want to say they led this, this, and this. And then when you do some backdoor references and some discovery and some due diligence, you find out they're on a team. Mm -hmm. Well, you just ruined your credibility with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, I have a lot of one-liners in my life, but less is more kind of works. That's a tell of a steak guy or a steak girl is, you know, we did, we did this. We were fortunate. They talk about the team. They don't talk about themselves. They're not saying I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, they're saying 
we had a great experience there. We had a great team. Yes, it was a big mission and we delivered it through a lot of hard work. They're humble. Mm. Um, <clears throat> those are people that are attractive to other people. They, people want to, people want to work with, they want to play with, play on the team with people like that. Yeah. You know, um, nobody wants to be Kyrie Irving. Nobody wants to be Russell Westbrook. Those are basketball references. Okay. You have no idea. Dude. <laughs> um, you know, nobody wants to be, hey, I, I got to shoot 50 times a game. No, nobody wants to play with that yeah. person. You know, I want to I want to make my team better. Yeah. You know, that's the people that get asked to do things because the folks want to, hey, I want to work with somebody like that. You know, so um, there's a distinct difference between those two. And if I go to a tech after five or a um, – you know, some kind of a tech event. I, I've been in a place where I can evaluate people for a long period of time. And I can, I can tell in about three to four minutes, are you a steak person, mm. a delivery person, or are you a sizzle person? Let me tell you how great I am. Yeah. It's pretty easy to figure that out most of the time. Yeah. A good salesperson is painting a picture of you, right? The, the potential, um, uh, client or the potential mm -hmm. uh, customer. Mm -hmm. It's painting a picture of you in your best life, having your needs met and being happy. It's not painting a picture of the greatness of the the company or the salesperson, et cetera. Right. And, and I, think, um, I think that theme is relevant with, um, with that networking aspect as well, right? I wanna reflect well on my current or past employers or team, and I wanna project forward uh, value on my future partners and my future team. You know, I say, you know, when I, I do consulting work in creative media mm -hmm. and my, you know, and this is genuine, so, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a tactic, but my favorite part of what I do with a client is the discovery process where I get to see how I can add value to the potential client. Right. Um, because when I see the value of what they could be or what they could be doing, that gets me excited about being able to help them. And that excitement is what allows us to go on a journey together and, and do the thing and make something that didn't exist come into existence. The point you make there is adding value to the other person. And uh, I was having a conversation with somebody last week that um, this person is going to be looking for another job. Mm -hmm. But you find the higher up in an organization you go, the more subtle, the more esoteric some of these tactics are. And so this person said to me, I've got to get on some panels. I've got to do some speeches to raise that person's profile so other people will come and ask this person to come lead a team. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with looking for a job. And sure. I don't want to miscommunicate that. There's nothing wrong with, yeah. hey, I need to be in this place and six months or 12 months or 18 months or what have you. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but how you do it is important, not only to your credibility, but also I think to your personal <clears throat> view of yourself and your well being. Yeah. You know, again, you don't want to be the person that says I'm the greatest thing of all time. Nobody wants to work with that person. Yeah. Well, let's shift over into our, our next main area. So this is uh, sort of theme number four on our wrap up. And this idea of proximity. I won't give it any more padding than that. Walk us through this theme, Barry. Well, uh, proximity, again, is one of the foundational cornerstones to some of the uh, journeys that we've uh, tried to highlight in the podcast, Nathan. Uh, almost everyone that we've talked with uh, has said, I had some level of proximity, uh, unbeknownst to me most of the time, mm -hmm. um, to somebody who could help me, to a mentor, to an influencer inside the organization, maybe to a CIO or a CEO even. You know, Will Sprang talked about he worked at a bank or a credit union or something, and he happened to be doing some side projects for the CEO who saw potential in him. That's proximity. Um, and that person said, hey, I want you to come and do this with me. I want you to come do this with me. Well, <clears throat> you know, if if Will was in a 10,000 person organization and the CEO didn't know who the heck he was, then Will, Will probably wouldn't be in the place that he's in. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to uh, put yourself in a proximity to folks who can help you learn more, be more, grow, 
um, <clears throat> learn new skills, um, take on new projects, be challenged. That's an important thing. Mm -hmm. It's not only important, and it sounds a little bit selfish, put, your pla put yourself in this place, but <clears throat> that's really how people grow. You know, they don't do it, as we saw through the pandemic, on their own, just on Zoom or on YouTube and learning. A lot of people did a lot of great stuff, but traditionally that's not how people have progressed. They've progressed through doing some of the things that we're talking about today, some of the things we've heard about in the podcast, but also being in proximity to somebody and open. I remember Skip Lomar talking about being open. He, he had proximity, but he was also open to those conversations. Hey, will you do something that you've never done before? Yes, I will. Um, so proximity and, and trying to understand who is in your, who, who are you in proximity to? I think if people write that down on a piece of paper, on an iPad or what have you, that's probably an exercise very, very few people in the world have done. Hmm. But it can be very insightful to say, who am I in proximity to? Who are the 10 or 15 people that I interact with who I think can, can help me grow? Hmm. Um, that will make you very aware, very cognizant of uh, the kind of influences that you're around. So proximity is a under the radar um, skill set. It also reminds me of this goes back a little bit to the idea of mentors and being being a mentor, um, especially for some of these folks who have you know more decades under their belt, um, you know than you or I do, mm -hmm. where they received that benefit from those they were in proximity to, but now they're turning it around. And so I, I think about that exercise you just described for, you know, the listener who's, you know, a leader or an aspiring leader to write down those 10 or 15 people and then identify like which of these uh, are potential uh, allies or assets that can pour into me, mm -hmm. but which of these can I then pour into? Like uh, how does the proximity go in both ways in terms of of just being that positive force. And as you become that nexus of positive energy where whatever you get close to, you're able to draw benefit um, and learn from those who are sort of ahead of you, but also let that benefit overflow to those proximal to you. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a real, is a real superpower. And like you said, it's, it's kind of an under the radar thing, but can, that can be your, your super strength. Yeah. I mean, if you think about a lot of leaders, whether they're, um, coaches, whether they're political leaders, whether they're business leaders, a lot of times they're in places um, that they are now because of proximity that they had when they were younger in their career. So you think about, I, obviously I'm a sports guy, so a lot of coaches hang out with coaches. Shane Beamer at USC, his father was a legendary Hall of Fame college coach for years at Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech Frank Beamer. Well, he just grew up in proximity, not only to one of the greatest college coaches of all time, but also all of his friends and Frank Beamer is beloved across the across the football world. Um, and so he if you look at a career like that, he has proximity to all these people, you know, so he had great uh, assistant coaching, graduate assistant jobs, partly because he's really good at what he does. Mm but partly because he had proximity to these folks and they got comfortable with him, yeah. you know? Uh, but the other thing is in proximity, you, you mentioned it, um, is what can I get, but what can I give? Mm -hmm. It's a two way street, you know, it's always a two way street. So, you know, if I'm mentoring a younger person, um, which I'm doing on a pretty regular basis, yes, they're learning a few things from me, hopefully, but I'm learning a lot from them. You know, I'm learning a lot from them. Um, uh, I had I was out of town a couple of weeks ago. One of my staff, who's a 30 year old, I was lost and I was in a critical thing where I just had to have some help. And uh, she jumped in and helped me and she taught me how to do something that I hadn't conceptually. I knew that it could be done, but I didn't know how to do it. And so she taught me those things. And so, um, you know, hopefully I'm adding value to her, but she's definitely adding value to me. Yeah. I think that um, that theme of humility, it's not one on our list, um, but our, our last one, our number five on this list is kind of a one of those skills slash value overlaps. So I heard you say, you know, humility is a big 
piece of the equation, but very tied very closely to humility is this fifth idea of curiosity. So mm -hmm. staying curious. And you, I don't think you can be curious without humility. Because if you're, if you're not humble, if you think you've arrived, then why would you need to be curious about anything? So talk about uh, staying curious, Barry. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, Phil Yanov's episode, he talked about being curious and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and the practical things of that. It's not some um, intellectual exercise. It, he can put real skin on that and show you how to be curious and teach you how to be curious. And he's taught me how to be curious. And when you're talking to folks who typically you would probably not interact with, but being humble enough to say, this person has something of value that I can learn, good, bad, or ugly. Um, you know, I may like this person. I may respect them. I may not, but I can still learn something from them and hopefully they can learn something from me. And that hunger to be curious, to learn more, to do more, to be more, to be, you know, <clears throat> as much as you can be, I think is a really important hallmark for a lot of people and staying curious about yourself, about your career, about where you're going in life, about what I can learn from other folks. Um, it is just so valuable. Patrick Lencioni, I think I referenced one of his books. I think it's the ideal team player, which is a great book. If our listeners haven't read that, they need to read it. Um, but he talks about three things, being humble, being hungry and being smart. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I'm not real smart. Uh, I think we've proven that over the last several hours. Um, and I try to be humble, but I'm absolutely hungry. Um, and humble and hungry go really well hand in hand with staying curious. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the person, I, I, again, I work in the tech world. So I work with companies that are backed by VCs and big money and this, that, and the other. And we get a lot of arrogant pretenders in the tech world. Maybe that happens in other industry, not sure about that, but it definitely happens in the tech world. So that pretender mindset, which I mentioned earlier, um, you, you take that and that's a turnoff for me uh, professionally, but also if you put the arrogant part on top of that, I'm not curious about those people. Mm. Maybe that's not a good thing, but that's, I just heard too much of it. But staying curious and saying, Yes, I have capability and credibility, but I want to learn from you. Um, that that's a rare combination of of both um, attitudes and skill sets. You said something there. Uh, you know, the the profile of of someone who sort of ter switches your curiosity off. Um, you know, a little little tongue in cheek in terms of you know you maybe you could still get curious about how did they get there or what behaviors are they doing that's making them such a turnoff. You know, there, there's some something there, but more than that, there's a reciprocal nature to these uh, to these leadership traits, mm -hmm. right? When you are someone who is curious, it draws their curiosity to, to you as well. That's right. When you are someone when you are someone who is humble, it draws those people with similar values of humility to you. And so curiosity, again, talking about kind of a sneaky superpower, it's free. <laughs> All it takes is you paying a little attention, being deliberate. Yeah. And the reciprocity of curiosity um, is a powerful thing where you become curious and that that draws others to you. Maybe not in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. You're asking a, a leader, you're curious about kind of a veteran, um, in your industry about uh, about them, it's not that they're going to turn around and say, "All right, well, you know, Jane, tell me more about about your career." They might, mm -hmm. but it's more that uh, it kind of makes them it perks their ears to go, "Oh, here's someone who's being curious. Why are they being curious? Um, what's going on with him?" They seem to be kind of dialed in, and it'll draw that uh, curiosity to you as well. It seems. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, it makes me think while you're talking, Nathan, that. Uh, I'm in a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people where I'm asking them a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm a generally, genuinely curious person, typically. What I find sometimes, though, is when I'm asking questions and they don't ask me anything, mm. that makes me wonder, okay, are they not curious? Mm. Are they scared to ask me a sure. question? Are they... Uh, that arrogant pretender and they just want to talk about themselves, which most people love to talk about themselves, yeah. as you all well know. Um, so it, 
in my brain, because I'm just kind of wired to ask people questions, um, uh, when somebody doesn't reciprocate and ask me, that tells me, hey, I'm giving you value mm -hmm. by trying to allow you to showcase, you know, kind of your uh, superpower. Sure. Uh, but if you don't turn around and ask me something, then that tells me that, well, that doesn't tell me anything. It really leaves me in, in a funk going, mm -hmm. well, why would you not be curious about the person who's giving you value? Yeah. So um, I think staying curious can be um, something that can be, it is free and it can stay, it can be exercised every day. Yeah. You know, whether you're at the gas pump or at Costco or yeah. in the workplace or at home or with your friends or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think there's a, you know, someone showing up to a conversation without questions. Again, there, there's a whole host of reasons why they might not be asking them. Um, some of them cultural, some of them personality wise, you know, whatever. But you also have to know enough to be able to ask an intelligent question. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not being afraid to reveal my ignorance. Um, as long as I, in turn, am am truly curious and willing to to do the digging, so that I can ask a better question next time. Yeah. Well, I, it reminds me um, as well that one of the pieces of advice we give candidates is always have at at the end of an interview, whether it's a first interview or pre screen, you know, a, a third interview, always have questions to ask. Mm -hmm. That curiosity shows you're humble. Mm -hmm. um, you want to, to your point, have done some research, but you're not going to know everything. Sure. You know, your interviewer doesn't know everything. Mm -hmm. um, but be humble and say, hey, I did some research. I couldn't figure this out. I'd, I'd love to get some answers to X, Y, Z. Could you help me with that? Mm -hmm. That is very attractive to people who hire people mm -hmm. at any level in any organization. That person took the time to sit and think at least and said, Hey, I like ABC company. I d couldn't find this information on the web or the social channels or whatever the case might be. And they, they had the humility to ask showing that they couldn't find that, that, that is really, really, really attractive to yeah. people. I think Chris Istes talked about a conversation he had with a vendor and the vendor was replying to an RFP or, or something. And the vendor was asking, well, um, all right, what's your, um, what's your vision and what's your, your mission or, or whatnot? And Chris, you know, he said, well, it's, a, it's in a 40-page document that's on our website. Have you read that? Oh, no, I haven't read that. Okay, well, why don't we end the call now and you go read that and then we'll set it back up. And his point was, you know, not that he was trying to be a jerk or, you know, jerk their chain around, but, you know, number one, time is money, time is valuable. But number two, like, it, how could they enter a functional relationship you know, with vendor and client, it's a vendor and client, but how could they enter a, a good relationship if they hadn't each done due diligence to understand a way to ask an intelligent question instead of just, well, tell me, tell me, tell me what you've already explained to me somewhere else, but I just didn't want to go look for it. So, well, absolutely. And I would say doing research shows curiosity, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I'm going to take 30 minutes. Now, some, I know some people in the tech world who, who do that to death. Mm -hmm. Like I used to work with a guy, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, who would research a company for two weeks before he would make one phone call. Wow. Well, Barry's not in that camp. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, God bless him. His name's Bob, super guy. But, you know, you got to figure out what works for yeah. you. But doing some research shows you're curious. Yeah. Um, doing stalking, I think, goes to a different place. Sure. And that's kind of what Bob was doing. But um, he was also probably trying to avoid having an actual phone call with somebody. Yeah. You know, yeah. so um, I think, you know, doing research, having, so, you know, I have friends who go to Tech After Five and mm -hmm. Phil will publish a list and, and they'll, you know, hey, I want to meet Barry and Nathan and Sally and, you know, Susan and Sheila. And, um, you know, and so they'll look them up on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Well, that's curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I saw on your LinkedIn profile you went to Winthrop. Yeah. yeah tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that. You know, when somebody hits me with a question like that in an event or over the phone or what have you, I pay attention. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe it's selfish. Maybe it's uh, myopic on my part, but I pay attention because they were curious enough to do some research. Yeah. Well, 
five pillars, five themes from 10 plus episodes here on the Tech Leaders Talk podcast. There were many more. And as we sort of walked through it, Barry, a lot of these overlapped and a lot of them have rabbit trails of their own. So if any of this piqued your interest or any of the names that we mentioned um, stood out to you, you can find all of those episodes on our episodes page, techleaderstalkpodcast.com. Click around, you'll find all of the links to subscribe or episodes page and uh, reach out as well. If you have got a uh, question or a lead for a uh, guest that we should interview, someone we should be talking to or something you think we should be curious about, we've got contact information there as well. And with that, Barry, I guess we'll sign off on this one. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us today on the Tech Leaders Talk podcast. Learn more about our show at techleaderstalkpodcast.com and follow us on social media. We are Tech Leaders Talk Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And we're on Twitter at Tech Leaders Pod. Subscribe to our show wherever you get podcasts. And please share this episode with at least one person in your life who would benefit. Until next time, tech leaders, keep talking.